Hi everyone, in today's video we're going to have a look at design movements and how it relates to your uh, exam. So this will be on your second paper, paper two, which is like design principles and that kind of thing. It does link a lot to the designers and their work as well, so you will see a little bit of overlap and we'll bring some things up again and you'll see how they sort of relate. So what you need to know is basically each of the design movements that I'm going to show you, uh, what their sort of style is, what their sort of design philosophy that their beliefs were, and what their influence on modern design and manufacture is. Some of them are still very much like making a comeback. So the idea with the design obviously is that things go in circles, so things are popular for a certain amount of time, then they sort of fade out as new styles come in, and things that do like vintage, retro, trying to think like things come back around again. So this is page 196 to 202 in the textbook. I'm going to go through the main ones. Uh, but you just got to kind of think as I'm going through them, I also start to get you need to form your own opinions on the design movements as well and what how they relate to your preference to design as well. Because obviously, as I'm going through it, obviously, parts of my opinion you're going to see through as well. Obviously, I've studied design a lot, um, but it's important that you can also start to form your own opinions on it and think about how you would come across uh, these kind of designs. So when analyzing design and design from the past, you need to consider the following. So the cultural and social influences from the time. So when was it prevalent and what was going on at the time? So how can that affect the design? Uh, major technological developments of the time that come into play. So why were things made by hand at this certain time? Why was metal work really prevalent at this sort of time? And it's all about what's going on with the technology. So key aspects associated with the movement or the designer, and then the influences it might have on the design today. So the first one, arts and crafts movement. So this is a very, very beautiful design movement and um, appreciates the beauty of materials things like having the grain from natural timbers so a lot of like nice beautiful hardwoods are used the idea of the thing that things everything should be made by hand nothing was like painted to look across everything should have like the grain should be prevalent in it, it should be sure that you may have like stains or dyes of that kind of thing but you want to keep that nice natural look to it they really did resent the idea of machine produced products as it the idea being that there's no beauty behind that should be made by a very skilled craftsman, hence the idea of crafts from the design movement. But it should be made by a very skilled craftsman that like loves what they're doing, they put a lot of care into it, and it's all work into the idea of the aesthetic beauty of it. Uh, the main designers from it are people like William Morris uh, and Richard Norman Shaw, who, who were huge at the time. So that's arts and crafts movement. Next you've got Art Deco, which is around the 1920s and 30s. So the key features from those, like sunburst motifs, so they added like raised segments coming out the central central point. So if you look at this building on the left here, so you've got like, if you say that part there's the central point, you've got these like rays coming out that sort of like sunburst type of things. And it's used a lot in their architecture. Now here's a word I can't always say. So you've got a ziggurat um, pattern, which is like stepped pyramid style going up type of thing. Again, you can sort of see that on the same building where it's like steps and it goes... From a wider base, steps going up to smaller as well. And then a lot of like geometric forms. Now at the time, with Art Deco, a lot of the stuff was inspired by the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. Um, particularly with the idea of the step pyramid shapes and the geometric patterns were used. So obviously that came out in 1922. It was a huge deal at the time and it really did inspire the idea. Obviously they used a lot of gold in Egypt and that sort of thing as well. Uh, Art Deco was huge in terms of like architecture. There's a lot of beautiful architecture that is still around today. It's all um, listed buildings and that kind of thing. So main designers for that are people like Clarence Cliff, Aileen Gray, Alvaro Lato and Walter Darwin Teague. So I do have a look at their work as well. It is um, obviously depends on your preferences, but it's a very beautiful style. So next you've got modernism. So this evolved out of Art Deco. So these modernism is a very broad term, and we'll go into more detail in ones that sort of make up modernism in a second. So these design schools were founded at the end of the First World War. So when we say the design schools, modernism includes people or design schools like Bauhaus and Distill. So we'll look at Distill to begin with. So this is what you see on the screen here. So Distill, like like the basic rectangular uh, forms, it was all primary color schemes. So red, yellow, blue and so on and um, very abstract pieces so the idea that it looked pretty but it didn't really work well so if you take like this chair on the left here considered like everything very sharp edges all the like very contrasting colors looks pretty but if you were to sit on the chair it would be really really uncomfortable um it's a dutch school and um this still it's basically dutch for the art 
Um, and you do see a lot of distilled stuff still around today. It's still used quite a lot in decorative pieces. Uh, very, very simple, but really, really effective. So major designers from that, um, you've got like Robert Van Hoff, Geertje Rietveld. Um, I won't try and say the other names because I will butcher Dutch names. But um, so yeah, distill, part of the modernism uh, umbrella, and we'll have a look at a, another one now. So now you've got Bauhaus. So again, falls under the whole modernism idea. So this uh, is a, a German design school. If you had a look already at the design, uh, the video on designers and the work of Marianne Brandt, who um, was a Bauhaus designer and head of their metal workshop. So they had this whole idea of form follows function. So that's the idea that it must work. Function is more important than form. So something must work really, really well. This is all about how well something works. But then it doesn't mean it has to be ugly. It means it should work well. But then how it works should then feed into how it looks. So that doesn't mean they're not thinking about how it looks. The idea is that, okay, make it work first beautifully. Okay, then how can we incorporate how it works into how it looks? So they really did embrace the machine age. So they saw the idea, the beauty behind machining and fabrication. So it was a lot of metal work in there, a lot of chrome, that sort of thing. So they had a lot of geometrically pure forms that were still taken from Art Deco. They still liked the nice, simple shapes. And their motto, as you will, we like everyday products for everyday people. It was very, very functional. In my opinion, I think Bauhaus is fantastic. I can't, the chair you see on the left here is incredibly comfortable. You can get like replicas of these that are... I say relatively cheap to like a couple hundred pounds, but originals are thousands and thousands. Um, so we talk about Marianne Brandt down here again. She's one of the most influential ones. At the time, that house was going to be quite controversial because if you think about arts and crafts, where they think everything should be very privately made by hand, they didn't like the machine age, they didn't like metals because they thought it was like cold and ugly, where they like like natural timbers and things like that, keep the grain, keep it beautiful. So Bauhaus was kind of quite controversial because they embraced this new idea, this whole new, let's work from metal, how can we fabricate it, how can we make it beautiful? So it was, at the time people were like, oh no, I don't like this, but actually as time's gone on, it's proven its worth over and over again. So next you've got streamlining. So this design philosophy was seen as early as the 1920s when the first introduction of the idea of like aerodynamics started to affect how car bodies were designed. To, when you had like things like when F1 like and car racing in general starts to come in and the idea they start thinking about the shapes of cars and how wind flow affects like how things can move, that sort of thing. Uh, so the key feature of the design is all very flowing curves. The idea that things should look like they're moving while they're still staying still. It's all very smooth exteriors, bisected with chrome detailing, so a lot of chrome in it. Um, so it was developed alongside technology and modern materials, so things like Bakelite, which was a thermoplastic at the time. Uh, so the idea that application of streamlining to household objects was seen as like a side of modernity and things like clocks and fridges were started to have it. So it was a very, very popular idea at the time. A lot of very nice metal work. It's all very, very flowing. You wouldn't see a lot of like straight edges with it. So the main designers that you probably know will need to know from is like Raymond Lowry is absolutely huge. And then Henry Dreyfus as well is absolutely massive as well. So the last one. Uh, is, is Memphis. So this was most prevalent in the 70s and 80s, with the aims being as different as the modern area, uh, area as possible. Um, so you've probably seen this before, it comes up quite a lot at GCSE. So it's nice, bold, uh, colourful designs, simplistic juxtaposition of geometric forms. Now what juxtaposition of that means is basically things are stuck on almost like higgledy piggledy, like almost like there's no reason to how it's stuck on, so it's a bit random. They also use a lot of like anthropomorph like anthropomorphic uh, and zoomorphic traits, which basically means giving like human traits and making an object almost look like a human shape or making it look like a, an animal shape type thing. So it was seen as like a rebellion against the standard way of designing things. Um, it's weird for the sake of being weird. My personal taste is that, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the weird for the sake of being weird. I'm, I'm very much like the functional thing, I like the way things work. I like, to me, Bauhaus is like the ideal design, like everything works very, very well, but it's still beautiful at the same time. Whereas Memphis to me, things are supposed to be bold and in your face. Again, not gonna be overly comfortable type of thing. And it's just this whole weird for sake, weird for the sake of being weird, which some people absolutely love and some people don't. It's a very divisive uh, design movement. Uh, and their most famous designer really is Etor Stotas, is absolutely huge. And then Danny Lane as well. 
So what I'd like to do is I would need to produce a case study for any of the design movements we've gone through. Pick a particular design which you like, debate the good and bad sides of it, why do you like it, how does it reflect your design, your idea of what design should be, and then what was their lasting effect on the design world, uh, what has it been? If you've got any questions, if you send me a message on Teams or email and I'll get back to you.